Now, quantum mechanics is certainly a, a subject which is extraordinarily well supported. In fact, there are no observations which tell against the theory. And it uh, explains many, many things which were complete mysteries before the advent of quantum mechanics. In fact, I have a list of uh, a few such things here. A very limited list, but just so you get some feeling for the things involved. Quantum mechanics explains various things like the stability of atoms, spectral lines, chemical forces, black body radiation. I'll say a little bit about two of these things here. Um, the reliability of inheritance. In fact, that was Schrodinger pointed out that uh, to make inheritance work, you needed molecules, stable molecules. Um, he didn't know about DNA at the time, but it emerged that this was certainly a very important realization. We know about things like lasers, superconductors, superfluids, etc., 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 and many areas of technology. In combined with special relativity, one gets quantum field theory, which is essential for particle physics. And uh, in fact, last time I gave the same example here, but there are many others. This is the example of the accuracy that one finds in quantum field theory if you do it right. Uh, here is the magnetic moment of the electron according to the theory of quantum field theory, uh, quantum electrodynamics. And here we have the observed value. And as I said before, these figures may be a little out of date, but they won't have changed that much except perhaps to get a bit more agreement. And you'll see all these figures of agreement between those two. Let me start by mentioning two of the initial puzzles of physics that needed what well, really led to the formulation of quantum mechanics. The first is the instability of classical atoms. The idea that if you have a classical nucleus with one charge with a positive charge and these negatively charged electrons going around it, then classically they would simply spiral around, radiate outwards, and the, uh, you, they would disappear into the nucleus and you wouldn't have stable atoms at all. So that's a great puzzle on classical theory. And the other famous thing was the black body radiation. Um, but I, what I wanted to say here is that the basic problem, well, you could say it's Maxwell's fault. Uh, Maxwell, I mean, Newtonian physics worked beautifully well. Uh, one had these particles which interacted with each other. And if the universe was just made out of particles running around, uh, well, that would be fine. But then Faraday and Maxwell found that there were these fields permeating space and time which were continuous things and had their own existence and had as much reality as the particles themselves. And the problem is that the particles just have a finite number of degrees of freedom and the fields have an infinite number. And so that means that the number of degrees of freedom in the field is just out of completely out of proportion to the number of degrees of freedom in particles. So, and if one uses the principle that if you let a system settle down, there's this equipartition of energy, which tells you that the energy uh, is distributed between the degrees of freedom. You see that uh, because there's so many more degrees of freedom in the field and practically nothing in the particles, it tells you that the energy gets dragged out of the particles and goes into the fields. So this is basically the problem that's happening here and here. These are just instances of that feature of classical physics. So if classical physics were right, you would have these catastrophes that don't happen because the world holds together and we don't have these problems. And that tells us we need a different theory. Well, quantum mechanics really resolves the issue by making particles and feels the same thing in a sense. And so that's, so the balance is in some sense restored. Now, this is an instance of what's called wave particle duality. And the fields can, you can think of them as, well, there are waves in the fields, if you like. The fields, the waves of the fields. And uh, if you can show that in some sense waves and particles are more or less the same thing, which quantum mechanics is trying to say, then uh, you can perhaps get rid of this catastrophe. So we have the classical and the quantum worlds, and we have laws which they each uh, act according to. The classical world acts according to classical physics, and that's the C I've got up here. 
The quantum world acts according to what's called unitary evolution, and there is a system of equations which govern the behavior in the quantum world, but that's not the whole of quantum mechanics. There's something else which has to do with how you get from one level to the other. Roughly speaking, the quantum world is to do with small things. So you might say atoms, molecules, fundamental particles, and so on. And the classical world is to do with large things like this thing and so on. Well, that's a bit misleading, but nevertheless, in practice, that's what happens. But you need this way of getting from one world to the other. And that's represented by something where I've used the letter R. Uh, Think, for example, of a Geiger counter. A Geiger counter, a quantum particle enters it, and it makes a click. And the click is a classical level thing. So you're getting from one level to the other. And the process whereby you describe that, it's called the measurement process, or the reduction of the state. The R is to do with the reduction of the state. So you have a description which sits down here. That's the wave function that I was talking about before. And uh, it evolves normally on, in the quantum world according to this U process. But every now and again, you do something quite different, which is this other process. Classical physics, as most of us may be familiar with, is deterministic. That is, the laws, if you know what the state of a system at any one time, the laws tell you what the state of that system is later on. But the quantum level also is deterministic. There's this equation called the Schrodinger equation, which is a deterministic equation. But there is this other process, which is how you get from one level to the other, which is the reduction of the state or the measurement process, which is non-deterministic. And all the randomness comes in at that stage. Now, the point I'm making here is that you and I are mutually inconsistent. Well, it's certainly it's sort of in the blatantly R, if you like, because after all, U is deterministic and R is non-deterministic. So it's a little difficult to see how you could get something involving randomness out of a completely deterministic equation. Well, I'll say a little bit more about that. It's called the measurement problem, if you like. But I, I mentioned Tony Leggett before, and he used the phrase the measurement paradox, which I think is, in a way, a better description, because it really is a contradiction between, there is a contradiction between these two processes. And the reason that Tony Leggett was looking for a flaw in quantum mechanics is that he uh, thought that there was a real paradox here which needed to be resolved in some way. Well, let me say a little bit more about quantum mechanics and uh, the rules of quantum mechanics. Uh, I have here another transparency which illustrates a different way of looking at the particle and wave aspects of a quantum entity. At the top, we have the particle behavior. You have, imagine, a, a source. Let's imagine it's a photon. So here we have a photon source. Photon goes along. It hits this thing. You can call it a half-silvered mirror, if you like. It's, uh, officially, it's what people call a beam splitter. So the photon goes along here, and, or it might go along here. And we'll imagine detectors here and here. And the particle aspect of this thing is exhibited in this type of setup, because what you find is that either one detector or the other one registers the particle, not both, not neither. I should say this is an idealized situation. In practice, you might find sometimes misses it altogether. But in, in the idealized situation, it's either a or B, and it's a rigid, exclusive one or the other. And that's just the way you would expect a particle to behave. But if you set up something like this, a sort of interferometer, where we have the same beam splitter here, and now proper, fully silvered mirrors there, and another beam splitter here, and let's suppose these path lengths are all equal, what you find is that somehow it's always this detector which receives the photon, never that one. That somehow the two possible things that the photon might do, it might go this way, it might go this way, somehow mysteriously cancel each other out as far as this route is concerned, and they reinforce each other if it, as far as this route is concerned. Now, this is the kind of thing that ordinary particles don't do, but waves would do it. So if you imagine these were little ripples, and then they'd be split into two, and then so on. And they could either uh, be coherent or be uh, the opposite. They could either cancel or 
add, and you could get this sort of behavior. But what's very hard to see is how you can get this behavior and that behavior with the same physical entity. That's the puzzle of quantum mechanics. And the way one resolves this issue is by adopting a rather extraordinary procedure that is indicated here. If you have two things, let's, let's talk about it with the, uh, the second picture here. You two have two things which might happen, alternative A, and that alternative A is going the, the top route, like that, and alternative B is taking the other route. Uh, that in some sense, quantum mechanics says they both happen at once. So as long as you're at the quantum level, you have these two things, and they somehow coexist. And you have to get used to that idea, that different things can coexist in quantum mechanics. And you, what you tend to do is write, the, you add them up in this way. You t alternative A is one of the things, alternative B is the other thing, and you say they coexist, but there are also these multiplying coefficients there. You might have thought those were probabilities, which say it's a certain probability it does A, and certain probability it does B, but that's quite wrong. If it were probabilities, you'd never get the kind of cancellation that occurs here. And in quantum mechanics, the way one deals with this is to use these complex numbers. Now that's the process U, which I was talking about, where these superpositions are somehow preserved. They just keep on being preserved. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, but when you adopt the other process, the R, the thing which comes in the measurement process, you suddenly change the rules. And you do what's taking the squared modulus of these things, this funny symbol here. That means the square of the distance in this plane to W and the distance to Z. You take the square of each, uh, square of the distances. It's the squared modulus, as it's called. And the, rel r the ratio of those two things become the relative probabilities for two things to happen. So if you actually try to measure in which route was that particle, you'd have to do this process here. Well, that's something completely different. And OK, you've got probabilities. It's not deterministic. It's a completely different rule. And uh, that's the measurement paradox, is to try and understand how these two things can coexist. Here we have a source of a photon over here. I've got a bit more modern here. This is the laser rather than the light bulb, but never mind. Source of a photon here and a detector over here. So the photon goes zipping along, and the detector detects it. Well, there's nothing paradoxical about that. Rather boring, in fact. So let's make it a little more interesting by attaching a gun to this from some murderous device and a cat. And the uh, cat, poor cat, is uh, put to death by the device. Well, that's not very humane. I should, bear, you should tell you that these are all thought experiments. They're not things that uh, not, not recommended that you actually do the experiment. But uh, it sort of Schrodinger, who was a very humane person, um, I'm sure he never did the experiment, but he liked to put it in this rather dramatic form. But still, we can be a little kinder to the cat by inserting instead a mirror there. And so the photon goes sailing off up at the top, and the cat's fine. So that's OK, except that that might not have been a mirror. That might have been a beam splitter. And remember about our quantum linearity, what that tells us is that the two alternatives, photon going this way, a cat alive, photon going this way, and cat dead, have to coexist in superposition according to quantum linearity. So quantum linearity tells us that we could produce cats which are in superpositions of life and death. Well, sometimes if I'm in a bit of a hurry, I stop at this point. You're saying, isn't this ridiculous? And Schrodinger was saying this to show that it was ridiculous. And he, Schrodinger, it's fine for him to say that because it was his equation, after all. And he was more or less saying, don't believe my equation when it's applied to cats. <laughs> well, that's fine. But sometimes when I give this, uh, my colleagues say, no, no, you've been a bit sloppy here. You haven't taken into account the environment. So, well, for this lecture, I especially wanted to make sure I did that. So here we have, I think the dead cat, just not that it makes much difference. Here we have the poor dead cat, and it has to have an environment as well. Okay, so there I put it there. 
Now, what about the live cat? Well, okay, the live cat. Sorry, yes, the live cat. It needs its environment too, so here it is. Now, you may not notice much difference. I assure you that those little particles, air particles, are in different places. And just so you know they're different, I've done them in a slightly different color, but that's just to help you. They're not really a different color. They're meant to be the same color as the environment spots in the other picture. And what does quantum linearity say? It says that you get this. Not just the cat being in the superposition of life and death, but all those environmental particles being in superpositions of different places too. Doesn't seem to help very much, does it? Well, the official thing you're supposed to do is worry that you don't know where the environment is and so you do some process called summing over the unknown states and so on. Well, it doesn't, you can do that if you like, but it doesn't really help because if you're supposed to have some state, even if you don't know what it is, there should be some state that the system has. Okay, it may not be that's the whole issue then. Suppose somebody comes along. Let's go back to the dead cat again. I think that was the first one. Okay. I'm getting very complicated with all these. Here's the dead cat. Somebody might come along and look at the cat you see here. So I have an observer coming along. Maybe that's the key thing. An observer comes along and looks at the cat. And I've got even represented part of the state of mind of the observer, which is the, the, the observer seems to see a, perceive a dead cat. So we can, perhaps this is part of the quantum state too. You don't have to know what the observer's mind is uh, registering, you just have to look at the observer's expression. You see there's a rather grumpy looking face there. Whereas in the case of the live cat, well, yes, the observer comes along and looks at it. There we have the cat. And you'll notice that the observer is rather happier in this case. So, okay, there is a bit of difference. Needn't be huge. Uh, but the thing is, what does quantum mechanics say? Well, the observer is only made of material and all that sort of stuff, quantum particles and so on. So that observer ought to be involved in the superposition too. So this is the description that one is led to. I can get these things properly on top of each other, I hope. With a somewhat mixed expression and a certain mixed uh, perception. It doesn't really help. What about you? You can put the environment in as well, if you like. Here, here it goes. <laughs> I mean, none of these things really make any difference. Well, you could say that, and, and people do, and this is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which says that, indeed, the observer would be put into a superposition, but that kind of observer perception is not allowed for some reason, and the observer state splits, and they become two universes, one containing one observer and the other containing the other observer. Well, there's nothing in this which splits, I should say. It really is a superposition still, even if you believe it applies to the whole universe. Now, it is a, a view which is very often expressed about quantum mechanics, and it's called the many worlds view, which says that somehow this is what happens, and it's supposed to make sense of it. Well, the idea is, I suppose, that for some reason, perception states, whatever they are, aren't allowed to be this, and you're allowed to perceive one or the other. And it's not explained why perception states have to have that form. What I particularly don't like about the many worlds approach, I can see you're forced into it. You see, if you believe that you holds at all levels, you are driven to this view. So this is where quantum mechanics takes you, if you like. Or it does if you believe that it's a consistent theory in which you is the only thing happens, unitary evolution. Uh, and the resolution, according to many worlds, is that somehow you have to understand that perception doesn't do this and it, and it singles out one of these universes. It's conceivable that that is, in a sense, correct. The trouble is, it seems to me, that you're pushing your pre very precise physics. It's one of the things about physics. And all these rules that one's applying, they're very, very accurate, extraordinarily precise. And you're pu pushing it into an area that we know absolutely nothing about. We don't know anything, very little about consciousness, what it is, and uh, 
why one should get the probabilities of quantum mechanics out of this thing that we know nothing about. So it's conceivable it's the right answer, but it would be a sad thing if it were, because we'd have to know a lot more about things that we're further from understanding than we are about quantum mechanics. So let's... Uh, I, I would take the view that this is virtually reductio ad absurdum. As Schrodinger was trying to say, I, I think, that there is something uh, wrong with the, the, the standard unitary evolution view, or the Schrodinger equation, if you like. Let's, let's address some of the major views about quantum mechanics, the sort of ontology of quantum mechanics. I should say that I could spend about, not just the rest of this talk, but probably about three or four hours going into all the different ontologies of quantum mechanics. So I've only put a very limited list here, but perhaps the most uh, usual points of view that are adopted. First of all, I should make the point that it makes no sense to take a U-evolving, that is a unitarily evolving state vector, psi, don't worry about these funny brackets, that's just for a different lecture, basically. State vector psi as describing the reality that we perceive about us. You see, the many worlds says it isn't the reality we perceive about us because somehow perception does something funny at some level. But what is the Copenhagen view? This is the standard quantum mechanical view, if you like, Niels Bohr and company. It says there is no quantum level reality as described by the quantum formalism. Psi describes instead the experimenter's knowledge that in some sense it's all in the mind. And it's all in the mind, if you like, because ultimately uh, a measurement is made by a being with a consciousness. Well, it's sort of, again, driving you to this uh, view that you have to know about consciousness before you can interpret quantum mechanics. And here's many worlds, which I was just talking about before, that a view a U evolving state vector does describe reality according to that view. It's completely different, if you like. You see, the ontology is quite different. Here we say, here we say psi doesn't describe reality. Here we say it does. But all outcomes of an experiment coexist and each accompanied by a different mental state of the observer. And somehow that's meant to resolve the issue. Or you can take a pragmatic view, which is somehow the environment just makes life so complicated so you give up, do something else. And uh, that's quite a usual view in quantum mechanics. It gives you the right answers, so that's fine. You say you're not interested in ontology, that's just for philosophers. Well, that's, you can take that view and certainly make progress that way, but it's not very satisfying if you really want a picture of what's really going on in the world. My own view is the one in red here. Quantum mechanics is a provisional theory and that these things I've called U, R and C, there is some kind of hybrid. The, uh, th that is a hybrid, you see, but that's to be superseded by a new theory. And what we require is something which is a major revolution. I think it's worth giving you the view not just of Schrodinger, I told you about him, but one of the people who is usually considered as the sort of person who set quantum mechanics in the form that we use it more than any other person. Um, he established the way it's, it's, uh, it's used and so on. This is Dirac. Uh, Dirac, in fact, those funny brackets which I didn't describe to you, that's his idea. And a very good idea, actually. He talked about quantum field theory. Dirac believed that the infinities were fundamentally flawed and a new theory would be needed. I talked about the infinities at the last lecture. Um, I'm very disturbed with the situation because so-called good theory, that's uh, quantum field theory, I suppose, does involve, sorry, well, let's read it from up there, uh, neglecting infinities in an arbitrary way. This is not sensible mathematics. Sensible mathematics involves neglecting a quantity when it's small, not because it's infinitely great and we do not want it. That's a very... <laughs> Very Dirac statement, absolutely clear, absolutely to the point, and, and beautifully simple. I mean, there's no question there. <laughs> That's very Dirac. Um, and here another statement. But Dirac was not interested in the problem of interpretation of quantum, mechanic, quantum theory, e.g. E the measurement problem, regarding quantum mechanics as a provisional theory. Uh, and this the famous Bohr-Einstein debate, which it's considered that Bohr won. Einstein trying to show that quantum mechanics had a flaw and Bohr each time being able to refute what Einstein had suggested. And this is Dirac's comment on it. I think it's very likely, or at any rate quite possible, that in the long run Einstein will turn out to be correct, even though for the time being physicists 
have to accept the Bohr probability interpretation, especially if they have examinations in front of them. <laughs> You're right to the point again. Uh,